Good evening. Ken Robinson with Del Donahue reporting. And for the next 30 minutes, a look at the Topeka tornado. Residents of Topeka were aware of the possibility of tornadic activity last night. They had been placed on a tornado watch earlier in the day, much the same as residents here were. But little did they know that suddenly the tornado would develop so rapidly and move at such a slow pace and cause so much destruction. Tonight, the death toll stands officially at 14. An estimated 450 persons were injured. And at one point during the early morning hours, the mayor of Topeka told me at least 4,000 persons had been left homeless. The mayor also said damage had been estimated at $100 million, this a preliminary estimate. Before the tornado had finished with Topeka, it had cut a 15-mile-long path running from southwest to northeast, a path at times at least one-half mile wide. And you see the results. It leveled apartment buildings, tore roofs away from houses, uprooted trees, tore telephone poles from the ground, Water lines broke, spewing water into the air like a giant geyser. Gas lines ruptured, but fortunately there were no serious fires. This morning when dawn broke, it was hard to realize that this had happened. People straggled back to what was left of their homes. Some returned to find nothing but debris where the house was standing. They stood puzzled as though they were looking for help from somewhere, but at the moment didn't know where to turn. The shock was just beginning to take effect. One of the hard-hit areas was around 29th and Gage Boulevard. There, the destruction was almost unbelievable until you saw it in person. WDAF News cameraman Jim Watt and I spent much of the afternoon near 29th and Gage in Topeka, the first neighborhood to feel the fury of the tornado as it swirled down from Burnett's Mound. Residents of the area, as Ken said, had returned to their demolished homes early this morning and all through the day were carefully searching for anything of value. They were heartbroken, of course, but most seemed determined to make the best of a horrible situation. In some of the interviews filmed in this area this afternoon, you'll see an American flag fluttering in the rather stiff afternoon breeze, put there among the rubble by someone who wanted to show that he wasn't whipped, an attitude held by most who again must build a household. What is your name? Dennis Gamble. Now, we are looking at uh, what used to be your home. Yes, that's right. right. on north portion of this dwelling, so we waited until yesterday. And this was your automobile? Yes, this was. Where was it when the storm hit? Uh, well, just about, about this place? No, it's about, I'd say, 15 feet to the south of here and a little bit to the west. Parked in a 90-degree angle from this. It was turned around sideways, and the other cars were turned around sideways. Certainly all of these cars here, uh, the uh, three in the pileup and the one over there, all blown up. Yes, that's right. I would say they were. Where were you when the storm hit? Well, we were in the basement, well, of course, in the house. Did you see it approaching? Yes, we saw it before we went downstairs and then watched it out the back door for a few minutes before we... Would you describe what you saw? Well, it was a rather, rather large, wide funnel, I'd say. We apparently saw the top of it before it came over that hill. It was reported coming over that hill and we saw the top of it first and then heard quite a roar and we decided to get away from the doors. We got down between two furnaces. About how long did it take the storm to uh, leave this destruction here? I would say days? less than a minute, maybe 20 seconds. You lose concept of time or something like that, but it was just a real short period of time. When you came out, what uh, what was the feeling you had? Well, we're just glad we're still alive. I'm glad we say we climb out of there. Knew everything was torn up. I knew that since you did, everything flying out of there, so I knew it was pretty well torn up. One of the many people searching for belongings through the debris of what was their homes is Mrs. Carol Jarvis, who lives near 29th and Gage. Uh, Mrs. Jarvis, uh, have you been able to find most of your personal belongings? Yes, most of it, except for the living room furniture. We haven't been able to find any of that. You mean it uh, literally blew away? Yes, I guess so. I see you have a number of records. They came through the storm all right. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we even found a dozen of eggs in the refrigerator. Not a single one broken. Any other oddities? No. Oh, well, we found a door and, well, we found the door handles together and the complete door was gone. And we found a nail driven through a door and uh, found one of my rollers in an old box, somebody's box that wasn't mine. Would you mind telling me, uh, did you have insurance on your volume? No, we didn't. Just the car. We just got a brand new car. And we did have insurance on that. And you lost your car? Yes. Well, it's right there. You can see it's demolished there. Now, where were you when the storm hit? Well, I was starting after my husband. I didn't even know about the warnings, and the landlord came over and told me maybe I shouldn't be leaving because of the warnings. And so I stayed around. I was looking out the window, and they knocked on the door, and they said, we better go down the basement. 
And we looked out the window and saw the funnel then, and we just got down the stairs and got in the corner when everything started collapsing. All we heard was this great big noise. Is that it? Were you able to see anything at all out the um, basement windows as the storm went through? No. Afterwards, I went up the stairs and I saw things, millions of things flying around in the air. It was just horrible. Although it would be hard to pick out one of the hardest hit areas and being there all last night and today, cameraman Ted Rice, Jim Watt, and Sam Feeback seem to agree with me that it was the campus of Washburn University. The university official today estimated damage there between four and six million dollars. The official said that estimate may be a conservative one. Washburn occupies 160 acres in south central Topeka. Authorities said practically every building except two fraternity houses and some quarters for married students on the east side of the campus were damaged severely. The director of physical plan at the university said every tree on the campus was down. Bulldozer crews were at work today in the first stages of cleaning up the wreckage there. Meanwhile, officials decided today to go ahead with enrollment for the summer session, although it's not known yet where classes will be held. One official said it's not physically possible to hold classes on the campus, and we agree. Washburn's vice president for financial affairs, Richard Vogel, so no decision has been made yet on whether to try to renovate some of these damaged buildings. Meanwhile, Kansas Senator Frank Carlson's office has received word from the Office of Emergency Planning that that office said that if the campus is declared a disaster area, the destroyed buildings possibly could be replaced with federal funds. A survey of that damage by federal agencies is expected to be completed by 10 o'clock tomorrow. There was more damage as the tornado moved in the northeasterly direction and went through Garden Park, the Oakland area, demolished numerous homes there, and then swept into the airport. It just barely bypassed the Weather Bureau station at the airport. However, it did hit, and as the mayor said, 10 planes. We had a figure of 19 planes at the airport. Damage there, one official told me, was a half million dollars. And finally, the tornado did sweep up into the sky once it went past the airport itself. Dale?